Welcome to Roots of Representation, a podcast series brought to you by Knowledgy, a leading organization creating practical social science for a better world. The podcast series is a part of our larger National Science Foundation funded project called Black Rep for Kids, where we delve into the power of storytelling in helping young Black children prepare for and tackle the challenges of climate change. If you're interested in learning about how we can build a brighter climate future for Black children, their families, and their communities, you've come to the right place. Let's get started with Roots of Representation, the podcast centering Black climate story worlds for young minds. Hi, I'm your host, Ed Green, and I'm thrilled to take this journey with you as we collectively discover ways to increase and improve the representation of Black voices, characters, and stories in children's climate change media. Our guest for this episode is Jason Lowe. Jason is the co-owner of Lee and Lowe Books, one of the few minority-owned publishing companies in the U.S., and Lee And Lowe was founded in 1991 as a children's book publisher specializing in books featuring people of color. His work includes Lee and Lowe's Diversity Baseline Survey, which measures diversity in publishing, and several diversity gap studies, um, which have revealed the lack of representation across many entertainment industries. So we're really excited to hear about that. Jason is also a distinguished professor at Pace University's Dyson College of Arts and Sciences. So Jason Lowe, welcome to Roots of Representation. Thank you for having me. We're really, really um, happy to have you here and a chance to talk with you. Um, we wanted you to share some perspectives on the imper- the importance of diversity and its roots in media. But to start off, I'm going to ask you about your work and how you came to it. What inspires you? Um, how does it intersect with discussions around representation and climate change? So I'll just let you give us a little background that way. Sure, sure. I mean, um, I mean, I came to Lee and Lowe. Um, essentially, I had worked in different industries and. Um, the thing about Lee and Lowe um, that, that sort of drew me in was that, firstly, it was a small business back in 91, and I think I was employee number four or five, but, um, but, but I think that appealed to sort of my sense of just um, wearing a lot of different hats, learning a lot of things that I did not know anything about, um, and just sort of that being... Um, and I'm one of these people who have never been afraid of like a blank canvas, you know, and just being able to come in um, and and learn things um, in, a, in a sort of fly by night type of way, um, because um, I think that's the, the really the prerequisite for small business is that you never know what's going to be waiting for you when you walk in the door and you can't let it ruin your day. You have to basically say, okay, what is it we have to do here and come up with a plan and do it. So um, I'm not one who is into perfectionism in any way, and I don't um, consider myself an expert in anything. Um, And I think sort of that's what keeps me grounded, you know, in a way of like, especially when it comes to diversity publishing, is that there's so much, so many things that I don't know about and it it sort of moves me or or um you know sort of um, inspires me to sort of learn what i can about it and 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 to enough of a degree where at least you know we can do a, a a very good job on whatever it is we're going to publish so so i think in that way you know it's it's just uh those those are so the the things that drew me to this um this mission um, also, the mission itself, um, I just if I could speak a little bit about that. Um, I mean, the mission is to publish books about everyone and for everyone, you know, and, and to me, I think that when I was a younger person, I was searching for something that I could really kind of sink my teeth into. And, and when I was growing up, um, we didn't have any diverse books, uh, around, um, I mean, I remember um, as an Asian American, Chinese American specifically, the, and when I was 
kind of coming up in elementary school, there was just the five Chinese brothers. And that was something that you, um, when I was growing up in a very white suburb in Westchester County, that was the last thing you wanted to be associated with, you know, <laughs> as you were trying to assimilate as quickly as possible. So, so for me, I never um, had the books that we published. And, and um, I think it, it is one of those things that I feel good about of putting good things out to the world. Well, I really uh, appreciate and value the overview that you've given us because it also helps us to think about uh, dealing with contemporary issues and also tying that in to where there's also a void sometimes. And people of color in connection with that, that sort of contemporary issue is something that we're looking at in this project. So in your work and in your life more generally, what, what are you seeing as some of the most serious impacts of this issue of climate change on Black children and families? And I'm just sort of jumping there because there's more that we can talk about with respect yeah, to Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think it's, it's an interesting thing to, um, to contemplate because um, with this mission, it started with eth ethnicity, right? Uh, but then it's grown to um, encompass dis people with disabilities as well as LGBTQ um, sort of issue issues as well. And for me, just on my journey, you know, as um, just someone who is concerned about the world and the and the sort of direction it's going in climate seems to be the next thing you know um that we have to um incorporate into what we do um and you know because for me I'm, I'm a very green person personally like the choices that i've made you know in my home like i have solar panels you know i have you know all of these different things that i have chosen to spend my, my personal money on you know, also has to kind of connect to what I am doing professionally, you know, and I, I would say anecdotally, you know, that there probably has to be more books about, you know, uh, marginalized people and groups of people who are being displaced or, or, or you know, facing climate hardship. Um, but I will say that, um, that it has to be balanced um, editorially with um with uplifting stories you know that show uh solution uh people who are coming up with solutions or coming up with ways to sort of take this um this serious issue head on um and 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 how i relate this to sort of publishing is like um in the early days uh, many of our books were very very serious and and and, you know, that we would deal with the Holocaust, we would deal with slavery, we would deal with some pretty heavy issues, um, discrimination, and things like that. But but I think that you have to also show the light as well. Um, or, you know, and even though climate change, climate problems are daunting, you know, I think that there are people who are taking this on. And, and I think that would show young people sort of not only potential um, initiatives that they could throw their support behind it indirectly or directly, but also maybe let them know that, hey, it just takes a person that could even start their own initiative that could either help with or fill in a gap, you know, that current issues are not um, addressing. So, so for me, those are sort of the things I'm thinking about, you know, and connecting this, this type of work with what we're doing now. I really like uh, the fact that we're, we're talking about bringing together some balance here to get people engaged. I mean, there are disproportionate impacts that are related to threats. And, and, but there's also, like you're saying, there are opportunities to learn about solutions. And there's opportunities for people to see that there are people like them also talking about those potential solutions or embracing maybe even some of the ways in which we support each other as we become more green or as we become engaged in things that are uh, impacting our com community uh, writ large. So, yeah. I mean, I think that, that books are a good way to sort of inform people that climate change does not discriminate. Um, basically, you know, um, 
that the problems that I'm facing are the same problems that you're facing, that the same problems that other people are facing across the world, you know? So, so I don't, it's not a have or have not type of, of situation, you know, and, and there is no uh, plan B. Um, this is the only plan that we have and we have to treat it well or else it's not going to be able to support us anymore. Yeah, we're all in the same boat, yes, so yeah, to speak. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but we also want to make sure that even though we're in the same boat, that we have the ability to, to develop agency, to be uh-huh. engaged as um, solution uh, creators and not just feel victimized by it. Because sometimes what happens is the stories that we read or the, the books that we read might present the victimization side, or like you were saying, the negatives. But we also want people to see that there's a way to become action-oriented and work with others uh, who yeah. are also in the boat. And I think that's really that's really uh, important. And one of the things that I'm particularly excited uh, to have you discuss a little bit are the findings from this diversity baseline study, because as we're trying to get everybody in the boat (laughs) focused, we also want to make sure that the people who have access to or opportunities to create uh, ways of pushing information out and bringing information from the real world into what they push out. So how does the baseline survey sort of deal with this notion of representation in the industry publishing. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I mean, um, the the diversity baseline survey came from asking a simple question, you know, of whether uh, publishing had a diversity problem. And and when I, when I asked that question, it relates to workforce, the people behind the scenes who are making these books, marketing these books, selling these books, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, I think I think when you looked around uh, the conference floor when you would be at like an ALA annual or something like that, you could you could see that you know anecdotally you were seeing that there was obviously a lack of diversity on the on the floor and the people who were representing the companies um, that were were um, you know exhibiting you know at these types of conferences, but there was really wasn't any meaningful data you know to sort of back this up to sort of show where we were at and so you know i think a lot in a lot of ways a lot of these types of initiatives or activism or whatever it, however you want to refer to it start with answering a question you know and mm-hmm. so in 2015 we launched the first um, diversity baseline survey or dbs as we call it for short and um and and it was interesting because it it it's sort of like we we put it out there and initially it was it was um kind of a tough sell you know to get people to participate because you they they kind of suspected that the numbers would not look great you know and um but you know one one i guess attribute that i do have is that i i'm a pain in the ass and i'll keep coming back and asking you to join even if you say no you know a bunch of times and so so with with that um in the initial survey we got 34 you know, publishers and review journals to participate. And, you know, you got to start somewhere, you know. And so, so you know, in that way, the, the number reported overall from an ethnicity point of view was that the respondents reported that they, they, were, they were identified as 79% white, right, at that time in 2015. And so then we would run the survey every four years, right? And so in 2019, that number went down to to 76 percent and then recently we just released the 2023 um survey just last week and that number is down to 72.5 right and so what you're seeing is a, a, a trend line you know that's very consistent that's going down or decreasing in the right direction you know that's showing us that publishing is in fact getting more inclusive you know um Although, you know, when people report on this, they want dramatic change. They want big swings, you know. But I think, you know, as I've been doing this, and, you know, now it's just about under 10 years that we've been doing this. And I don't think those things happen statistically, you know, because you're talking about kind of large sort of change that has to happen over, a, you know, a pretty big workforce, right? And so, so the change you're going to see is more incremental. You know, and I think that sort of 
uh, realigns your own expectations of what you're looking at and what you're sort of deeming as progress, right? Um, but but I think that um, the the overall attitude, you know, toward DBS has changed. Whereas I said in 2015, it was a bit of a, you know, uh, uh, some convincing had to take place. But then in, in 2019 and 2023, it was more like people were coming to me and saying, when's the next survey going to come out? You know, we'd like to join. We want to know what, where we're at, you know, so, and, and, I think we've had an amazing response rate, you know, to um, the survey where, you know, it started out, we had about 3,400 respondents, you know, and then in the second survey, it went up to uh, 7,893. And then in the latest one, it went to 8,644. You know, so again, going up, the participation is going up. And with response rates around 36% for the last two surveys, uh, from a social science point of view, that's actually unheard of because like response rates to voluntary surveys like this usually average around 10 or 15% maximum, you know? So, so I think that shows, you know, that even though change is not happening, you know, you know, in a big, big way. The attitude toward wanting a more inclusive industry is sort of showing its way, showing up in different ways, you know. And so, going back to your original question, how I think this may impact things is that a more diverse workforce may result in a more diverse, you know, product, you know, of books that are going to be published from different points of view. You know, and I mean, I know it's playing the long game, but that's sort of kind of what we do, though. Like if you were to look at there's another data set call, uh, put out uh, from the Cooperative Children's Book Center in Madison, Wisconsin. Right. And they've been doing that. Um, that data set for decades now. And when we started, we would always look at that. And the amount of diverse children's books that were published each year would be below 10%. And this was for, for over 15 years. The needle did not move. You know, and then only recently you would see that that, that percentage is going up, right? And and so, but it takes time. And I and I sort of implore people to have patience, you know, because um, when you're doing these types of things, it takes a long time to to sort of see results. And, and, and that even goes back to books themselves. They take a long time to make, you know, like if I were to acquire a picture book today, it would not be ready for three years, you know. So the books that you publish or decide that you're going to publish have to have that kind of long view you know, sort of embedded in it as well, that, that the thing that you're buying today is still going to be relevant three years from now, you know? So, so I think the nature of publishing, you know, kind of sets itself up for long, long view type of, um, you know, uh, outlooks, you know, and I think DBS is basically the same kind of thing. You know, um, and so so I, I feel positive. I feel, you know, that we that it's going in the right direction, you know, but and, and I'm always looking forward. What's what's it going to look like in four more years? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, but it's a long time for something to sort yeah. of wait. Yeah. But it, it may be worth it. It will be worth it, I think. Uh, and, and also, I'm thinking as you're talking one one of the ways in which we can get people, I think, more engaged is to help them to understand how certain approaches to publishing uh, are not necessarily um, things that are are put into play to slow people down. <laughs> That's what I, what I'm hearing too. And so, you know, do you think that that the DBS uh, is something that we should be uh, building into conversations with potential uh, writers and, and authors, so that so that they bring that information with them, along with the focused information, such as what we're trying to do with this climate representation um, project. What, what yeah. can we do? Uh, I mean, I, if anything, I think the methodology of publishing would be well suited and applicable to climate sort of initiatives as well. Because even though 
you know, the, the clock is ticking, obviously. Some of these things are going to take, you know, um, some years, you know, to bear fruit. And, and, and that's why I think that a lot of things have to sort of be done in many different levels, you know, like you have short term gains, you have long term gains, you know, um, I, I think that with publishing, you know, I look at like, um, the emphasis has always been on recruitment, you know, we want to recruit more uh, people of color into publishing, right? But now the next step has to be on retention, on keeping those folks engaged having them choose, you know, publishing as their career, you know, and staying in here for the long haul, you know, and, and that's really what's going to change, you know, the product mix and things like that is when folks who are of different backgrounds come in, stay, then they are going to gain, you know, the, the authority or the, um, the essentially uh, autonomy, maybe is a better word, you know, to sort of see, um, these type of projects, you know, to, you know, their fruition, you know, and, and I, I think that, you know, if we were to relate that to climate, you know, initiatives and activism and projects like that, uh, I think that people have to think long game on this, you know, but in many, many ways, you know, um, not get discouraged, you know, um, that, that people may say no, or whatever, you know, it's just that you, you got to stick it out, you know, and when they realize you're not going to go away, then things can happen, you know? So, so I don't know if that answers your question. It's, yeah. it's sort of, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little hard to sort of draw a direct line between the two things, but um, I mean, publishing it in books is like no other, you know? Um, and I think that it's kind of a throwback type of medium, you know, and that everything is so quick and, and basically in the palm of your hand, I could, I have a computer in my hand and I can look anything up, but, but books are not like that, you know, and, but that's why I think they endure because, and that's why they also um, impact popular culture so much because a book has been through so many rounds, you know, of the, of the, of the author rewriting the, the manuscript, but also the editors chiming in on, you know, what's wrong, what's right, what's working, what's not, you know, and then when those things sort of become, you know, into the world, then uh, the other mediums like television and movies are like, well, they've already solved all the problems here. All we got to do is, is basically throw money at this and bring it, bring it to life in a different form, you know? So, so I think that, Books are one of these things. Yes, they take a long time, but they're they're very finished products at the end, you know. And yeah, they're not perfect either, but they've definitely answered a lot of questions, you know, in as on on their path to publication. Yeah. yeah. Well, creating a community of practice um, around this work, I think, is one of our one of our goals uh, with this project and also bringing different types of people to the table, whether there are publishers or people in behavioral and mental health areas or people who are budding authors or individuals who have an interest in child and family issues. If we create a community of practice, I think we can share the content knowledge that we want people to explore in different ways, but we can also share those structural issues that help us to, to better either understand how to move, move in a direction that get us to that point where we're going to be engaged or help us move in other directions because there are other ways in which we can create story worlds that can be the interim between what we do initially and what we do in that final book. But I think in terms of improving and increasing uh, representation, uh, the one of the things that I've really liked about about the work that that you and your organization have done has been how you have engaged people to think about this and to get them on the pathway to doing something about it. So could you talk a bit about how Lee and Lowe Books has encouraged writers of color, especially those who've not had children's books published before? Yeah, no, I, I think... That was like a, a, a kind of one of those moments when you when you think you're looking at this thing. And, and what's kind of good about like the owners of uh, Lee and Lowe is that we're publishing outsiders. We, we did not work in publishing. And so we could sort of see 
um, the industry and, and the output kind of objectively. And what we noticed was that the people of color who were publishing uh, were, were getting republished or published again and again and again. They were doing very well for themselves. But we also noticed that it was just like a very small group of authors who were getting published, like very tiny, right? And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm sure their wallets are looking quite quite well, you know, but that's doing nothing to expand the pool of diverse authors, you know, who are putting out different ideas and and maybe different outlooks than these small group of folks who are getting published. So, so I mean, we we did start a couple uh, writing um, contests, the New Voices Award um, and the New Visions Award, and both of these contests were directed at unpublished authors of color um, to try and sort of inject new blood, you know, into the industry, um, because I, I think that you know you have to sort of have um, that that pool of authors has to be growing all the time, you know, and because you never know, you know, and that and that's sort of like I think that from a from an acquisition point of view, when you um, you're 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 taking you're designed to acquire a manuscript, and you've never seen this subject before, you know, it's, nothing has been published about this subject before, and that is really the the kind of um, diamond in the rough type of thing that you want to be breaking new ground all the time, you know. And and I feel that like more often than not, when when we're taking these book these these ideas that are books into that we're going to make them into books, we we are breaking new ground and it's exciting, you know. And I think that you know that's the type of thing you know that we sort of always have had an emphasis of in. And it's kind of baked into our mission as well, you know, that we like to sort of work with new people who are new to the to the field, you know. Yeah, yeah I, and I think that this is really important, and that's why I also really consider uh, Lee and Lo to be part of helping us to understand the roots of representation. Right, you know, the roots that hold things together are also those opportunities to bring people to the table, and uh, to to set up things uh, like uh, the various awards that, that you've, you've described as opportunities for people who haven't had a chance. In terms of climate scientists and, and researchers, how should they be playing a role when we're thinking about authoring these kinds of stories that include science, areas of climate and weather and et cetera? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I, I sort of think of a think of this along the lines of like, um, I don't think of it purely as science because the science to me is so indisputable. Like there's nothing to really argue about the science, you know, this is happening whether we like it or not. Right. Um, so, so, so when I think about this, I, I sort of think about, um, kind of like the, the energy that kids can bring to this that maybe is unique to, kids um that may be an aspect that maybe adults are missing you know like i i when I, I i sort of think that kids have like an energy and a passion you know for things that that is far you know sort of um like every day is 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 something that's incredibly important to them right and i i think that that's something that can be harnessed right um um I, I sort of look at some of the things that have been happening, you know, that maybe I support, like um, there was this, um, this group, they're called um, Children's Trust, right? And they, and they just won like a big law um, case in Montana, right? And so Montana had this thing uh, written into their state constitution that basically said that they guarantee, you know, um, a clean, you know, environment. Um, and so, so I think they latched onto that and basically said that, you know, in terms of signing new projects in Montana, you know, that were sort of about oil and burning fossil fuels and things like that, that they went against the state's constitution because it was endangering their ability to have, you know, this clean environment, you know, that they could grow up in. So, so anyway, the court ruled in their favor, and I sort of see that um, sort of 
kind of going into other states that were go- going to replicate or try to replicate the, this type of win, you know. And and for me, it's like kids are basically at the forefront of these these initiatives, you know. And 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 I think that so you look at that, and that's something from that's happening right now. But then you look back at um, we did a book a while back on um, on let's see. It's blanking right now. Um, Bangari Mata, who um, basically she was a Nobel Peace Prize winner for um, a tree planting um, initiative that she started that basically went global. And, and and what I think about that is I'm sure that like she since passed, I think she passed away in 2011. But I think that, you know, we have a lot of solutions in place like EVs and solar and heat pumps and things like that. But I think we also have to go low tech and, and plant more trees, but in a, in a large scale, because trees are basically, you know, they're, they're filtering CO2 24 seven. They don't need a break or anything like that. You know, so to sort of like um, kind of address these things in a low tech way and a high tech way. And then, um, and then I and lastly, I think that kids and their parents have to advocate for um, like the voting age to be lowered to 16 years old, you know, because um, kids kids future is at stake and they have to be allowed to vote, you know, for candidates that are, are going to have their best interests in mind, you know, and. And I think that, that that would really tip the scales, you know, and, be, and being able to get some of these really hard to do initiatives, you know, um, going is that if that a new voting block were created, you know, to come in and basically elect people who are going to basically be, be fully behind these things, that could really change things dramatically. So, um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of spitballing here. <laughs> no, I, well, the reason why I really, I, I love this is because we need to be in a writer's room now <laughs> so we can create some story worlds around these ideas. Because I think what you're talking about are the kinds of things that we can make relevant through the different ways that we talk about the world around us. Mm. And, and, and even in those stories where we're talking about families and, and how they're engaged in doing things just around nature in their yeah. community can tie into then themes that talk about what we can do to be more responsive and responsible citizens. So I think you've hit that. You've hit it right where I would like to see more of us go with this con- with this conversation. Before I let you go, I, I wanted just to, to, to acknowledge the fact that um, I followed Lee and Lowe for a long time. I remember in, it must have been in the early 90s when I, fir- I went to the National Association for the Education of Young Children's Conference and you guys were on the floor. Oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and I remember that early on because it was a place and space to sort of look for things even then that represented a more diverse group of people. And so this whole idea of advancing early literacy and language development and advocacy has been something that I've always associated with Lee and Lowe. And, and I'm glad to be reconnected again uh, because um, you're anchored in this work. And you're rooted in the work of representation and context of children's development. So before we let you go, Hmm. I want to ask you, are there any individuals or groups or resources that we should be aware of? Any things that we should be aware of? One of which, of course, is the survey, which we'll make available uh, on our website. But are there any other things related to environmental or climate solutions that connect to this work that you'd like to share? I mean, hmm. and you've already shared, yeah, several I've shared, during the shared of some. It. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that there there is um, something that may or may not be related to climate, but is definitely related to publishing, and that is the the problem that we're having with um, banned books right now. And um, because I think that if 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 things are allowed to sort of go the way they're going. It, it may be very hard for you know companies like Lee and Low and and other companies that are are fully invested you know in these type of initiatives to continue on you know because um, the banning is is quite um, 
spread out, you know, and there doesn't seem right be to be rhyme or reason for the kinds of things that they're challenging. But the one thing that we do see is that there there are a lot of diverse stories being challenged, you know, and you know whether it be LGBT or whatever. But but you know, it's it's more so that the, if they see a black or brown face on the cover, it's likely to get challenged. And and so some of the things we're talking about directly relate to the connection of of this project itself. Is if we're talking about doing more stories about you know different types of groups that are being impacted by climate change you know how are those things going to sort of make it through if you know publishers sort of see like oh if i publish a book with a brown face on it it's going to get challenged or banned so what where's the sort of bottom line for this type of thing so so i think that you know people who value this type of work need to be aware of what's going on there. And I think it's political. I don't think it has anything to do with the books themselves. You know, I just think it's, it's something that like you have the other side or the people who are doing this are doing it for a very, very specific reason, you know, because books stay with you for your entire life when you read them and they make a, make an impression on you. And talking about long game the long game can be played on the opposite side as well you know and i think that's what's happening now well i think you've provided us with some essential information and perspectives but also some guidance in terms of how we think about doing our work and how we come together and being realistic about how we're doing our work and engaging each other in a way that we can move forward so i just want to thank you so much jason for taking the time to speak with us today no worries. No worries. Thank you, Ed, for having me. This is, uh, it's always been fun and I hope uh, provocative and thought provoking. <laughs> well, I think we've, we've, we've created that and we look forward to continuing the conversation with you as our project progresses and we deepen this exploration of roots and representation, Black centered climate story worlds for young minds. Thanks again. And we'll talk to everyone soon. Thanks for listening to Roots of Representation. If you'd like to comment on this episode, please head over to blackrepforkids.knology.org. Our website also contains free resources and more information about the project, which is led by Knology in collaboration with the Highlights Foundation, the National Black Child Development Institute, the Association of Children's Museums, and a panel of nationally recognized advisors. Remember, Black Rep for Kids isn't just a podcast. It's an essential part of the project's culminating experience, which will be a two-day unconference event held in fall 2024. Head over to the website to register now. And in the meantime, let's keep the conversation going. You can also share your ideas and resources for amplifying Black voices and stories in children's STEM literature at blackrepforkids.knology.com. Org. Roots of Representation is produced by ABF Creative, an award-winning podcast network that creates cultural and emotional connections through podcasts. The series is funded by the National Science Foundation's Advancing Informal STEM Learning Program under grant number 2314101. Any opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this podcast series are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. Roots of Representation, the podcast centering Black climate story worlds for young minds.